So I'm Graham, uh, Graham McAllister. I'm the founder of Player Research, which is a UX research company in the UK. So we've heard the term UX a few times today, and UX comes in two types. I'm just clarifying this from the start. So uh, there's UX design, which uh, you saw before, and they're the people who would maybe help a programmer get the stuff onto the screen. They would help translate the programmer's requirements onto the screen. I'm not that guy, uh, nor is my company. We're UX researchers, so we're trying to figure out the games that you make are they any good? Are people playing them the way you want? Are you on track to be successful? Because the players say so. So that's what interests us. We're a company of UX researchers. We study people playing your games. It's more or less what we do. And today's a bit unusual for me because I'm picking on one individual game and saying what happened. And I never really do that. I talk about how things work and all the rest of it, how developers can do a better job. But it's very rare for me to single out one game and say, what on earth happened there? What went wrong? That's exactly what we're going to do. So tonight's a story of such uh, in four parts. Um, so we work on many of the top games worldwide, by the way, uh, and some of the ones you've never heard of. So from indies all the way up to the games at the top of the charts today. That's normally our business. I have to make it clear, we did not work on this game. I'm just trying to say that's the case. I'm picking on it because I find it interesting. I picked it because I think you would find it interesting. Because it's a PC indie game that honestly could have, could have come from anyone. So let's have a look what happened. I realise, by the way, the title's a bit pessimistic. <laughs> but there is, um, there, is a, there is an upside because at the end you're going to see it, it's avoidable. It doesn't have to be this way. But that's what happened to these guys. So anyway, let's move on because there's a lot of stuff to cover. Before I talk about it, I want you to do one exercise. And I don't know what game you're making, by the way. But if your game fails, if your game does not deliver what you want it to do, I want you to think about it now. Even better, write it down if you can. If you've got a bit of paper or a phone, just type it in. And I want you to think about if your game fails, why do you think that would have happened? What are the reasons that your game will not do the things that you want it to do? And I want you to write it down because in the future, I want you to read it back. I, I don't really want you to just do it mentally, but if you do, that's fine. The thing I want you to think about is the real reasons may be different than you think. That's the point. I think the things you write down are, and the real things that what re, well, maybe why your game will fail, they'll be very, very different. All right, let's move on. So stage one is setting the scene. Let's talk about the game. I'm going to show you the game so that we all know what we're discussing. So the game is called Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Has anyone heard of this or played it? Two, three, four, three or four, let's say. Okay, um, and that's very rep representative, I would say. <clears throat> so this is the art style, the sort of thing you'll see in the game. Um, I'm just gonna show you a one minute video. And if we're lucky, we might get some audio, but I don't know what will happen. So all this voiceover talent, uh, these are all basically superstars from the world of doing voiceovers and games. So many of the AAA games you've played, they've probably been voiced by these people. The reason they're showing you this is it's a narrative heavy game. So the, the voiceover really matters to the whole, the whole reason of the game. Did I mention it has a thing in it? Okay. So that's a quick intro to um, the game. This is the art style, uh, and, and this is what you do the other, the other half of the game, let's say. So it's a walking simulator with also heavy use of narrative. So that's important to this whole story, the story in four parts. You do a lot of walking, and there's a lot of listening or talking. So this is your character in the center, the skeleton, and you walk across actually the land of America, and you exchange these stories, etc., etc. 
So there's one thing, I'll just jump out, there's one thing to bear in mind. Pre-release, um, this game was winning awards. The lead designer had just done Gone Home, which got great reviews. It was an indie darling. So he's already had some degree of success with his previous game. He came off that game, left the company, Fulbright, I think it was, set up this company. Um, even before it was released, it was winning awards at conferences and things like that. They had pretty much all the major voiceover talent already signed up to do the narrative. They had lots of journalists in the games industry writing the dialogue for the game itself. Um, did I mention they had Steam? So imagine you're in their position. Imagine here's you about to release your game and you're winning awards, you have all this stuff. I think you'd be feeling pretty pleased with yourself. We are on track for something pretty awesome. Look at the list of writers. These games journalists wrote the, wrote the script to the game. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this, right? Pre-release. Stage two of the story. Release. I think you can tell where this is going, by the way. But then on with the story. So the game comes out and it does not go well. So I just picked random reviews. There's dump don't uh, attribute any significance to the ones I've chosen. They were genuinely random. So 58, I think we'd all agree, is not the score that you want for your game uh, in, in, in any uh, genre. So it's beautiful with tra tragic scenes, um, but they're just too thin. This narrative game, there's just not enough, you know, interesting narrative there. Uh, game of Spot says, yes, the soundtrack's good, uh, and there's some, you know, or many evocative short stories. Um, some parts are even cool, but the gameplay itself is just, well, boring. And this is part of the problem. Um, this narrative is not satisfying. You can talk about how many stories you have. You can talk about who's doing the narrative. You can talk about the quality of the writers. But it doesn't matter if it's not interesting. Just because you've got all these famous people with all this experience, that does not indicate anything about the quality of your game. In fact, the history of the video game industry says exactly the same. So, currently on Metacritic today, it's sitting at 75 from the professional side, which is actually pretty good. Uh, but the user side is, tells the completely different story. The players, the ones who are actually giving you your money, and the word of mouth effect, and hopefully give you enough business to make a second game, they are definitely not so happy. Very far from it, in fact. So these are some of the Steam reviews. This game's on PC only, by the way, at least at the moment. So let's look at some of the things that are being said on PC. Well, there's some positives. The writing, the soundtrack, the art, the voiceover. All the things individually you would think would make up components for a good game. However, the translation of those components. Um, again, the same sort of thing. The players are going, yeah, yeah, individually these things are good. The art is good, the writing's good, the music is good. But, it doesn't mean they're interesting. Um, some other strange things have come up. Um, good controls. I mean, that should be the basics, right? We'll revisit that. <laughs> and also meaningful choices. If you're making a narrative game, even if you look at any narrative game ever made and you see why anyone has criticised it, if you don't let the player make meaningful choices, you know you're going to be criticised for that. So they're not even looking, it seems, to the basics of this genre. It's a narrative game with Walking Simulator. We'll get to the walking in a second. Actually, the good controls uh, pretty much applies to the walking. So yeah, yeah, there's interesting bits, but the walking is not so good and the narrative is not so good. You can see where the problems are coming from. The two main themes of your game, eh, no, not so much. Some other reviews, again, this tells the same sort of thing. Lots of stories, lots of content. 200 stories written and voiced over by all these amazingly talented people. That sounds like a recipe for the best narrative game ever made. But it turns out, well, not all 200 are interesting. In fact, it's a really small set of them that might even stay with you. So why did you need 200 then? Are you diluting your game or are you adding to your game? Well, the players are saying you're diluting your game. This is another review. So I took a there were two negative reviews. So I took one from Steam, which had a thumbs up. Let's see if the positive ones are saying. Well, I really enjoyed it. If you enjoy stories in general, 
Okay, so we know who we're appealing to, people who, people who like narrative games. And folklore in particular, so not just stories, but folklore, that's a certain subset of people, right? Okay. And Americana in particular, so stories, folklore, Americana. So if that's you, okay, um, then you might get something. You can see the sort of, this is the positive review, right? So it's like, if you're a subset of a subset of a subset of people, then it might be interesting to you. That's not the most positive review ever. So this is the first section. This is the same guy. Or girl, I don't know who it is. But look at the list of negatives. So that was their most positive thing. If you're a subset of a subset of a subset, you might find it interesting. But by the way, there's a few problems. Definitely a flawed masterpiece. Controls are wonky as hell. What you have to do isn't well documented, not immediately clear, no visual clues, particularly confusing. So again, these are the positive people. These are on the side of the developer. They're trying to persuade you to part with money. If you can get past some of these frustrations, some, it's quite, it's quite a list, to be honest, um, you might be rewarded with a rich game. So again, if you read these reviews, and I do encourage it, even the most positive, the people on their side, they're still trying to warn you, by the way, this may not be for you. It's not the people you want on your side, is it? And it's certainly not the game that I'm sure they imagined. By the way, this is not UX research. I have to make it clear. My job is not reading reviews and things like that. But it's a particular, you'll see why it's relevant later on. I'm trying to represent in this game a game that was released. I was trying to understand their failure. And so my first port of call in everything we do is to the player. Edge, um, is, which is probably my magazine I go to for a sense of sensibility and, and calmness. They don't tend to give out tens easily and they don't give ones and twos easily. Edge give it a five, which I think probably is where this game sits. So I'm putting this as a barometer and saying, yes, there are some magazines and review sites out there that are overly optimistic and there are some that are pessimistic, but there are certain places I go to for a sense of calmness in the games industry. Edge would certainly be one of those, one of those sources. Uh, disclaimer, I did write for Edge at one stage on user research, but still, I did not write game reviews. I was a commenter on players and things like that. So here we are. Stage one was the game. Stage two was them saying pre-release. They were looking, you know, going to be awesome. Sorry, stage one was pre-release. Stage two was release. They were on the up, 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 up. And then they came down hard at the stage of release. Now we're getting to the research side of things, which is, could we have anticipated that? Did it have to go like that? So, um, I read a lot of these reviews. Some I showed you, some I didn't. I just read all the reviews, and what I did was categorize the issues. So, okay, what are the players criticizing? Yeah, there's a few things up there, some interesting comments. So when you group all those comments into positive and negative, some themes start to emerge. Um, in research, you may call this grounded theory or things like that. You start with no preconception, and you start grouping the uh, the chunks of information. So again, the positive things were quite clear. It was an interesting concept. It's this, you walk across America and exchange stories. Okay, that's pretty cool. I've seen nothing quite like that. The writing, out of the best writers in the industry. Cool, that's good. Great music. Did I mention it had Sting? And the art style. So that's a pretty good set of things on your side. If you're trying to build a successful game, that's, that's pretty cool, right? However, uh, bear in mind, this is all from the player side. Um, what sort of game is it again? So at the very top, I said, it was an interesting concept. But the flip side of that was people didn't actually know what it was. So what, is, what is this? You walk across America and you swap stories, but where's the game? What do you do? What do you do in this game? They didn't know. It's hard to tell. And we'll come back to this theme later. Um, lots of stories, the writing was great, yeah, but few of them are actually memorable. Few of them actually make you feel anything. Individually they may be strong, but as a collective, as a game, it wasn't there. Um, the pacing of the game, everyone said it felt slow. Not just the narrative was slow, the walking was slow. So again, these themes are coming out. If you've got a walking narrative game, and the walking is poor, and the narrative is poor, you're, you're kind of heading in for trouble. Um, the game is confusing, there were some tech issues, which is outside of my concern, but they were there. And above all else, what's the gameplay? All these things together. 
So let's look at this list. This is the list that came from the reviews, and we've grouped them into positive and negative. But what's difficult to say from that is, well, does that make for a good game or a bad game? Because you have this list, does that mean the game is more in the good or more in the bad? Because it's actually pretty hard to tell. So as a researcher, we have to use models to help us say, well, what side does this go on? Now, as a company that runs playtests day in, day out, we would run a playtest, and we would figure out all the results, and we would show it back. We didn't work in this game. This is me trying to reflect and say, is there anything I would add as a UX researcher that would help, um, help us understand this? So one of the models you may have seen before is called the Kano model. And it's not for UX research at all. It's actually for product development or product release. And there's a few things I'm just going to describe very quickly. The paint line is the things you must have. So if you don't do those, you're immediately going to lose a lot of your audience. There's things that people expect. If I was releasing an MP3 player that couldn't play music, well, you'd be upset about that, I'm guessing. So there are certain things about games that you expect. And in the case of games, usually it's usability. I don't have to expect that the controls don't work. I expect that you've done that job. So those are the basic things that games must have. The yellow line could be called, like, they call it performance here, but really it's like gameplay. And the better you do it, the better you get. An easy example would be the better your art, well, the further up the line you move. The better your music, the further up the line you move. The better your gameplay, the further up the yellow line you move. So a better gameplay could be more depth or more breadth, ideally a combination of both, but you don't have to. You get the idea. So this is a sliding scale. And then the blue line is the attractive things. They're the things that you're making that nobody else has. You come to my game because it's got X. Wow, I've never seen that before. I want to play your game, I'm going to check it out. And the thing is, if you have nothing in the blue category, you're kind of heading for trouble as well, because your game is a bit like everyone else's. That doesn't mean you're definitely in trouble, because you can always do better. I've got a new Tetris game coming out, but it's the best one yet. That could be okay. If you're the best, that's fine. But bear in mind it may be hard to justify that to someone just because you said it. So the blue line is definitely interesting. Most products and most games have something in the blue category. That's why you're making the game. You decided to make a game because you're dissatisfied with what's already out there. So we're going to pick them. So you probably do have something out there. So this is uh, the y-axis is satisfaction from very satisfied down to I hit it pretty much. And on the x-axis you've been different, which means you've spent money and time making a feature, no one cares. All the way out to we care about that, it's pretty cool. So this is the, the spectrum we're going to cast these things onto. Okay, so um, the writing. The writing was a unique feature. They made a big deal about it. We've all these games journalists doing the writing for us. Awesome. You're, you are ahead of the rest of the industry. You should make a big deal about that. That's pretty cool. The problem was the writing turned out to be not that interesting. So it went from something that was unique and interesting down to actually below the OK line. People complained about it. If this, uh, the center of the axis is OK, they were not OK. People were saying the narrative is not enjoyable. And that's kind of the point of the game. So where they thought they were, and where the players thought they were, were not even close. Where else have we got? Did I say it had Sting in it? <laughs> so Sting is pretty cool. If you have Sting on your game, you're, you're going to tell people, right? The thing is, in the reviews, he didn't really come up. <laughs> he, people were just like, yeah, whatever. He didn't add anything to the game. It could have been anybody. It's good for marketing. But in terms of adding to the player experience, which is what I'm interested in, and you're interested in, and the people paying for your game are interested in, it didn't do it. What else we got? Uh, the controls. You saw some of the comments. Wonky as hell. Things like that. Uh, you'll see what the developers have to say about their own controls uh, in a second. But they didn't even meet the must-have. People expect to control your game. Unless you're making something like QWOP or something like that, where the controls is part of the difficulty in overcoming, people expect to be able to control your game. And they couldn't get that right. You'll see why. The pacing, everything was slow. Moving across the land was slow. Again, the basics, people expect in a walking simulator that the walking is okay. And it wasn't. Uh, what else did we get? To Confusion. Quite a few people said, I don't know what to do. I don't know how these cards work. Do I trade them? What does that icon mean? People expect you to teach them how to play the game so that they can make intelligent, meaningful choices. 
this is a game about choices. Now, if you don't teach people that basic essential tool, they're going to get upset. They're going to get upset. Tech issues outside of my concern, but lots of people complain about frame rate, stuff like that. And again, this concept, there was nothing else like this game. It immediately cut through all the white noise. However, the concept that was so initially appealing, it was okay in places. So again, okay, this section three we're talking about is about anticipation. As a researcher, as someone who studies people for a living, and employs people who study people for a living, if this was the results of a game we were working on, would I have said, would we have said that this game is heading for success or heading for trouble? I don't think anyone would think this is a picture that looks like success. It does not look good. And it's certainly very, very far away from where I'm sure the developers thought they were heading. Okay. So inside my company, Player Research, this is the sort of model we may use as well. It's not formal, but you'll get the idea. So we'll divide the Kino model, or something like it, into these layers. At the top, you have player experience. It's why we play games. But beneath that, you've got things like usability, which is much easier to assess. Beneath usability, you've got understanding. Do people understand your game? And at the bottom, you've got, are people even interested in your game? So we're trying to work your way up from the easy stuff, easier stuff, all the way up to, is your game fun? So I'm going to move on quite quickly and try and map some of these. So Sting is part of the appeal. It gets people interested in your game. Okay, fair enough. Confusion is just about mental models and understanding. So they're failing at that layer. All the controls, show up usability, they're failing there. The pacing, well, that attributes to the user experience, they're failing there. The writing, people didn't care that much or only cared about a very small set of the stories. So that wasn't terribly successful. Even things at the bottom of our concern, like QA and tech issues, they feel there. And this concept, again, the concept was appealing, but it didn't quite translate. So no matter which model you use, either a Kino model or the sort of stuff that we would use internally as part of our playtesting process, they're failing at all these fundamental layers. Do people know how to play your game? No. Can people use the controls? No. Do people enjoy the riding and walking? No. Again, anticipating success, or anticipating failure. Is this something that looks like it's on the right road or the wrong road? And bear in mind all these variables here. At the very top, you've got success. I know success means different things to different developers. For some, it's financial, because you've got a business. For some, it's review scores. For some, it's downloads. With some developers, you only want to reach you know, 100 million downloads. And we don't care so much about money. That's fine. If that's your goal, that's your goal. That's your metric. There's no problem with that. But these all stay the same. They're all the same for us. So the reason why I wanted to write this talk is I saw this Medium post from the developers themselves, and they said, what went wrong? And they tried to understand it. So yeah, you, you can go and read this yourself. Are we going forward? We're not going forward. OK. I knew it was a mistake trying to present from a phone. It's entirely my own fault. So back to this. This was their post-mortem. They said, these are the things we got right. We got all these talented writers, blah, blah, the things you heard before. That's true. You, you did do that. And this is what they said um, they got wrong. Number one was lack of playtesting. We didn't get people to play the game. That's what they said. We just made a thing, and we were winning awards. We, our previous game was successful. I mean, what can go wrong, right? <laughs> Turns out quite a lot can go wrong. Um, lots of interesting stuff here. Yeah, number four, they forgot the PC had a keyboard and mouse. Had, had anybody else forgot that, by the way? That the, the PC has a. I keep forgetting, I, I don't know. But, so they were playtesting it themselves with a joypad, and everyone else had a PC had really got the keyboard and mouse and went, I can't play the game. And you couldn't. So, um, yeah, you know, experienced developers, and take from that what you will. What I find interesting in their self postmortem and what the player said about their game was that I feel they haven't really learned what the core problem of the game was. I don't think they really admitted. The game wasn't fun. These are specific discrete elements you can point to. Yeah, the controls, we could have taught people better, a better tutorial. Oh, it was 2018, the market was tough. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Your game wasn't any good. That's what it comes down to. That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I want to hear developers admit. If you can't be honest with yourself, you will never learn. You will not become better. If there's the least one thing you can do is be honest with yourself. Admit it. What went wrong? 
if you can't listen to the people, then you probably won't get very far in this industry. Well, you might, but you can make it easier for yourself. Here are some of their phrases that they wrote about. Um, so they talked about commercially. Commercially, how well did the game do? Well, fewer people bought it than I have Twitter followers. Um, it didn't go well. This is only in the first weeks. I, mean, I need to be clear, but still. Bearing in mind that your first initial launch is your biggest spike of, of sales, and we all know this. Some other comments. So far, I have made zeros from the game. That might look like a high number, but consider it took four years to make. So, so basically, he spent 140 grand of his own money, uh, and maybe he could afford to do that. That's fine. That's his choice. But at the minute, it doesn't mean he hasn't sold anything. It just means it hasn't made any money. There's no profit yet in the company. Just be clear about the two different things. But this is the one that really got me. It's astounding that a game that got this much attention from the press, that won awards, that had an all-star cast of writers and performers, had a bizarre celebrity guest appearance. Did I mention it had? I don't know. Feel this hard scares me. It scares me that they didn't see it. When I look at this as a UX researcher, it was obvious. It's obvious the path they were on. The awards don't mean anything. A journalist playing it for 10 minutes is not the same as you or I playing it for 10 hours. That's not the same process. Do not be fooled by the thing, these external validations. The players are the ones who will validate your game. And they didn't do it. And this is what it led to. So again, I'm surprised at their surprise. Why do they not see this coming? If I look at the Kino model, and I take the player feedback, or I look at the, the model we would use in player research, or one of them, to help structure these feedback, it's fairly obvious where it's going. So it means the model they were using, the metrics they were using to predict, are we on a path to success, were way different than reality. Um, this is, I'm going to skip over this very quickly, but this is a comment I hear about in the game industry all the time. I speak to about three or 400 studios a year. We work on about 100 games. And this is a common issue that I hear is, but we got these people to, to you know, great programmers or great artists. I mean, man, it was tough. They think that just getting talented people is enough to make a great game. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. It doesn't work like that. Yes, everyone's talented. They can all do their job, but it doesn't translate to a great game. So um, no matter which model you look at, the raw player feedback um, or the, the, these models, it's not, it's not shaping up pretty well. The fourth phase, the bit I'm really interested in, probably the bit you're really interested in is, okay, I don't want to do that. I definitely want to avoid that situation happening to my company. So what do you do? Bear in mind I'm a UX researcher, so that's, you can see where it's heading, but, but it's true. So this is what we said the problems were, and we said this is the layers that these issues were happening. They had layers at the um, understanding stage. They even had layers at the appeal stage, because people didn't know what sort of game it was. What do you do? Yes, the music was interesting. Yes, the art was interesting. But what do you do? They couldn't communicate it. Lots of usability problems, specifically controls. And ultimately, they had lots of player experience issues. And specifically, the two main areas. Uh, the, the walking and the pacing of the walking and the writing. So some things they could have done. Uh, a simple thing is a concept test. Some things that we work on in games, we bring up the narrative for the game or the artwork way before the game's ever made, years before the game's made in some cases. And we ask people, what do you do in this game? And they're like, okay, this is what's going to happen. Like, cool, that's exactly what's going to happen. And if there's any difference between what people think will happen and what the developer's thinking, if there's a mismatch there, then we try and fix it. Again, they didn't do that. They didn't understand that they had a communication problem. But that could have been fixed years. This game was four years in the making. The first week, you probably could have done that. Didn't have to happen. Um, all things around mental models or teaching the player and controls, that's straight up usability testing. They, they, could have, they should have done that after, after a prototype. They didn't do that. On to the slightly harder stuff, well, much harder stuff, the pacing and the writing, much more subjective. You know, what we like is different, so you need more people, so on. But a UX playtest or an appeal playtest, depending on what you call it, that's exactly what it does. You get a large number of people into your room to play your game, you do a well-designed survey, and you figure out that's asked questions around pacing, writing, characters, art style, anything subjective. So all their problems, there was a method that exists and has existed for a really long time.
to do exactly those things. That's why they're there. So don't make mistakes in these areas because they're all preventable. So I'm just going to map these two together to try and figure out, you know, when could they have done it? So this concept test that they had a problem with, we run them from the very, very early stages. Most companies do. EA would do it, Ubisoft would do it. It's not a great shake. So why are they figuring out four years later? Why are they figuring out when the game's released? Oh yeah, people don't know what we made. Hmm. Should we have done something really early to figure that? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Usability confusion. Um, understanding, sorry. Um, as soon as you've got a prototype, hey, let's, let's <laughs> test the controls. Let's put the joypad down and pick up a keyboard and mouse. Maybe that'll be interesting. Maybe, I don't know. So again, these simple things that could have, do people know how to play the game? Have we taught the rules effectively? They can be done really, really early. They should be iterative, by the way, so I've done it twice here just to show you. They're not a one-off deal. You're meant to iterate. The writing, again, we test the writing on, um, on some games from the very, very early stages, but it's just text. It's not even in the game. There's no art at all. We just test the text completely separately from gameplay, from art, from music. We're doing all those things at very early stages. Most of these are pretty, uh, often double A or triple A games, but still. Uh, the pacing of the game, well, you could get some feedback during the usability play test, but that's a poor method for getting feedback on that. Really, you'd be doing that with much longer um, play sessions because things like writing and pacing, you want someone to play it for a few hours maybe, not just, oh, they played it for 40 minutes and they said it was fine. No, that's, that's a problem. You should not use that method for assessing things like this. So across their four-year cycle, you know, <laughs> they could have been doing this at different stages really, really early. That's the takeaway here. Um, so three different types of testing they could have been doing, a concept test, usability test, and a UX or appeal play test. We've got about 10 different methods, but these three in particular solved their problems. You would not use the same one method for solving all your problems. That doesn't work either. Just don't do usability testing all the time. That's only gonna fix some things. You need to design the right test for the right problem. So if this was their problems, this is what they should have done. Okay, let's move on a little bit. I'm running out of time. Um, cost, I'm gonna give you the cost that we would charge because that's all I know about. Internal to EA, Ubisoft, or Microsoft, they'll be higher again, I'm guessing. But this will give you an idea of what this sort of thing would cost. You can do it much cheaper yourself to various degrees of success. But again, I'm showing you here because it's what I know. So concept test, what would you do? Maybe 30 to 40 people, people in your target area, not students, <coughs> just saying, probably. Um, someone else, someone who doesn't know you. Try and be, try and do that at least. It takes about seven days to do that. Roughly around three days of preparation, one day of actual testing, and then three days figuring out what happened. If you're doing it quicker than that, you're probably gonna mess up, just saying, somewhere along the line. That's a bit harsh, but anyway. Uh, usability play test is much quicker, uh, much cheaper as well. I'm gonna skip through this because you, you can photograph it anyway, or watch the video. And then at the end, the most expensive one's probably the, the appeal play test. Why is it more expensive? Because it's longer. You want people to play your game longer. You're going to recruit about 24 people, roughly, to play your game for around two to three hours. Maybe a full playthrough. It's up to you. It depends on the game you're making. This is their problem. I'm not saying this is what you should do. I'm saying this is what they should have done for this particular problem. So, hang on. You're saying they spent 148 grand and I'm standing up here saying they should have spent 55 grand, 38% to figure out their mistakes. Well, no, uh, let's get practical. I, I, I probably wouldn't recommend that. I'm just saying that's what it would have cost. And if we we're working on a game that cost 100 million, then yes, you should have done that. But with 140 grand, probably not. However, for 10 grand or nine and a half and 6% of the budget, should they have done that to fix all these usability issues that plagued them down here? Should they have went from this to this? And bear in mind, if you fix all those pacing and usability issues and tutorial issues, you probably would have pushed your writing and the whole concept of your game further up that yellow line. That's a no-brainer. They definitely should have done that. A really small percentage for a massive game? Yes. The other one? I don't know. It's up to them. Should they have spent the rest for the writing and the, and the, the pacing issues over longer periods? Again, I'm not going to stand here and say they should have done it. I'm just saying this one was a no-brainer. This one, well... It should have been a discussion at least. But look at the effect you can have. Here's the question I would ask them in retrospect. How much would you pay for all those issues to go away? What's that worth to you? 
I don't know the answer, but I'd love to ask the question. This is the final one. Uh, you want is like two minutes left. These are questions. I'd encourage you to photograph this because I would. These are questions you should ask yourself for every single aspect of your game. So let's have a quick walk through for their game to see how you can use it. So start the left hand side. Why should people care about your game? How are you going to get your game noticed? Did I mention they had? St doesn't matter. They had someone famous, you know, in their game. They had this unique concept. In terms of breaking through the noise, they did an awesome job. Good for them. Next layer, the appeal layer. Describe your game in one sentence. How large is your audience? They did not do a good job. People did not know what they had made. So in terms of appeal, they did a poor job. Not good. This dotted line is the download, by the way, at least for PC, uh, let's say, premium games. I have a different model for free to play that I'll maybe show you another time. So what about the usability and understanding? Poor job. Can people play your game? Have you watched people understand the rules? Can they use the controls? Nope, they did not do well with this game. What about the player experience? Well, it was varied. A very small group of people said they liked it, but the majority said, no, no. That is not enjoyable. And what about the end, revenues? Well, revenues is like a factor of all this stuff. It factors in everything. So they had an audience, which is a subset of a subset of a subset. And even for those people who like story-driven American folklore, American folklore, was that a good game for them? Um, no, not really. So you've got a really narrow audience and you didn't even make them happy. That's not great. So again, um, it's not a great picture. But I would encourage you for your game to ask yourself these questions in each of the verticals and see how well you think you're doing. Because I promise you, you've definitely got problems. For the 100 games you work on every year, and they're usually the ones at the top of the charts, they've all got problems. Real problems. It's, it's hard to avoid. So I just want you to know where yours are. That's all. Be aware of them. Actually, that's not true. Some companies, and there's one of them in here, I saw a t-shirt from a company that we work with, um, and they're awesome. They're unbelievable. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it is, but they're completely different than nearly everybody. Anyway, good work for that company. So this, this is the last slide. Um, this is the very last slide. It's just a, re a summary of what I said. We can take the feedback from players. Normally, as a company, we do this in a play test. In this example today, we didn't work in the game, so I got the player feedback. If you're doing this type of thing for yourself, when you play test your own games, take, take the feedback and group it like this, positive and negative. Don't make an assessment on your game. Just group it first of all. Then split it into these layers. Well, have we taught the player well? Can they do what we want them to do with usability? Are they enjoying it? Do they know what game we're making? Split your issues into these layers. Plot the issues onto the Kano model. Have we met the basics? How well up the yellow curve are we doing? Have we anything exciting to offer the player? Have we anything in the blue category? These verticals. Um, you're trying to get your game across the whole gaming industry. From marketing to appeal, getting people to download, giving them a good experience. Each one of these things will affect you, different part of the games industry, from selling to actually making a good game. Be honest with yourself. And finally, we said, well, these are the stages you can do it at. UX research, getting feedback on your game from a player perspective. It starts day one. Day one. If you're not talking about this at the same moment you have the idea, then you're going to be too late. It's the same time. There is no difference between UX research and the actual design of your game. Because the design of your game is how the player is going to experience it. It's the same thing. I think I'm done. One time. <laughs> Thank you. We started a little bit late. Ah, thank you for that. That's okay. I tried to hurry up towards the end. So. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Um, are there questions? We have time for one or two questions. Um, and in the meantime, the next speaker could already set up. Yes. Do you think that the calculation is actually accurate? I mean, uh, actually, you make one test. Probably some of those points will be, but reality is you do one test, stuff doesn't work out. Yeah, yeah. Budget increases, you test it again, stuff doesn't work out. Yeah. So do you think that it's 6% okay. 
because I would rather guess it's 30% of the budget with the same calculation? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You mean if your budget's smaller, for example, then the percentage is higher? No, no. So that was the big guess. You're like, that, that thing I show is saying this would normally for the PhD work on, but that's what happens. So we would do a play test, we would identify the issues, and then the company goes and fixes them, and then we iterate on that. Sure. Next, next but the percentage is up to you, it just depend on your budget, it just depend on how cheap you can do it. The actual, the you know, like diesel accurate, the 6.7% of the budget, yeah. that was definitely accurate, because they said. Yeah, but if you go back, and you have to do another test, which cost is the same. Ah, yes, you are yes, not, yes. you're not, uh, so the overall yeah. cost increases. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And then you go up to, as I said, so, yeah. I mean, if you iterate and you iterate and you iterate, the cost yeah. keep going up. Yeah. So where do you draw the line? So you draw the line usually whenever the player is playing the game the way you want. So the games we work on, we draw play tests and the player is not playing the game the way the developer wants. They go back and make changes and we do it again. And we get to a point where we say that is that is acceptable. So could it be better? Yes, but it's not worth it to do another test. So you want to draw the minimum line. When are we happy that players do this, we, we can move on to the next thing. But if they do these sorts of things, we're definitely not happy and we need to yeah. call it. So it's user designer saying, what are we happy with? I just think probably it would have been good if you would have added it because that's the reality of things. It is the reality. Yes. I, 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 I did hit that, it. but I do the truth, the two thoughts of the uh, iteration. I said you can do a test here, but I repeated yeah. it again. I was hinting at saying, you don't do this once, you do it yeah. multiple times. So yeah. yeah. Can we have one? Try turning it on. Test, test, okay. Uh, since you said you're working with AAA and Indies, do you, as I experienced from myself, for example, if you're an Indie dev, you have a low budget, and <laughs> even it doesn't matter if you have a high budget, yeah. if you have an idea, you just want to get it done and, and yeah. actually want the feedback after the release or not, which is wrong, uh, I'm with you that, but do you experience that often that maybe the egos of the indie devs are too big, so that they say, ah, it, it, Oh, definitely, but it's not just the indie devs, the triple A's have the ego too. Yeah. So it's a common problem across the industry. I mean, that's why I try and talk in the conferences and say, these figures, you can do it much cheaper, I'm just letting you know, I want you to do something. And these yeah. are the sort of things you could do to make these problems go away. Yeah. I think. The best designers we work with are the ones with no ego. So the ones who are willing to say, let's put players in front of our game and see what happens. But do, you know a lot, do you know a lot of designers with one? Some. I think, you know, it's certainly true that we have to chase some developers for a long time to, learn, to persuade them that they need to do this. And usually, by the way, they come to us when, they've been, when it's went wrong. So they've done it their way, and it didn't work out, then they, then they come back. Okay. Because I really experienced the first time I saw random people play my game and they, they said, oh, what's up with this? That I really felt down and yeah. needed someone to yeah. push me up. Do you, do you right. push up the people and say, it's OK. And it's <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very important point. You can feel negative and you're like, oh, they're not doing what I want. They're not playing it the way I want. Yeah. But bear in mind, you've just got better. You know, the positive side is I've learned something yeah. that I'm teaching someone, you know, uh, the wrong way. So, yeah. Thanks. So I'm um, just saying, Graham drove all the way with his car from the UK. So let's give, give him a big round of applause for coming here.